iniziamo. We can start? Yeah, the two, two words. <laughs> exactly, perfect. Okay, so we start next session where Davide will talk about general implementations and common approximations in the BDS computer. Okay, so thank you, Andrea. Now, the, the idea of this lecture is uh, to go a bit more on the details of uh, the implementation and uh, how to do beta salpeter simulations. But, so let me start again uh, stressing this point which you have already seen uh, in the lecture of Fulvio. So this was the end also of my linear response lecture. So we had this uh, Dyson equation for the response function within TDDFT, the TDDFT -T kernel, which fails completely in getting the optical absorption of silicon and even worse in, uh, in the case of solid argon. And uh, the reason now we know is that uh, this approach misses uh, excitonic effects. So the the approach was based on the idea that we take uh, the response function, we start from the DFT calculation, and from that uh, we go in G-space uh, and we, do, we go through this uh, macroscopic averaging procedure and we get uh, a macroscopic directory function. So this is not uh, a good scheme. And then now we ended up with uh, a more refined scheme where uh, you start from DFT, you get uh, this uh, response function, but you just use this for the screening. So we have this RPA screening. And this is, again, the starting point to build up on one side uh, the GW self-energy, quasi-particle corrections, and on the other side, uh, the exchange correlation kernel of BSC, so the electronal interaction. And I stress again that in the GW case, uh, you take a frequency-dependent screening. Uh, in the BSC case, uh, you take a, a static screening. So the, you put all this together, so you put the quasi-particle energy and the kernel inside uh, a new Dyson equation, and then you end up uh, with a new description of the macroscopic screening which captures excitonic effects. And, uh, okay, you have already seen that, but uh, let, me, let me comment again, in particular in the case of solid argon, the, the red dots are the experimental data. You have this very sharp peak, which now we know is an excitonic peak, uh, it's completely missing at the RPA, blue line, uh, or even TDDFT level within the LDA, adiabatic LDA. But then instead, when you add this piece of the kernel, the electronal interaction, you get this very sharp uh, excitonic peak. And uh, so we start from this concept, and uh, so I, the standard way to, to derive the beta salpeter, or let's say historically, the, one of the first way was through the Eiding equations. I'm not going to discuss that because you saw the alternative way from Fulvio. And then I will jump a bit more on the description of uh, how the spin enters in the Hamiltonian. And after uh, some long discussion on that, I will show a few examples on uh, optical properties absorption. And then I, I will also discuss uh, other physical properties you can uh, get from the BSC. So the focus uh, or the standard way of uh, speaking of the BSC is about absorption, but indeed uh, there are um, many more experiments that you can capture after you solve the BSC. And at the end, if I will have time, I will show you the connection between the Yambo input file and the BSC. If I will not have time, I will show that uh, uh, at the beginning of the tutorials uh, in the afternoon. So the beta salpeter is uh, this equation. So uh, Fulvio already derived it. Uh, let me stress about this uh, small four that you see on the top left of this polarizability. So it's a four-point polarizability, which means uh, even the independent particle one is written like that. So you have here six, seven, three, four. And uh, the deeper reason for that is that you have this kernel, so V minus W which enters partially in uh, two different ways. So V connects the 
two independent particle green function in this direction. And the W instead it connects uh, the two independent particle green function in this direction. And this means that you cannot just take uh, a closed equation, so the P2 would be closing 6 and 7 and 3 and 4, and write the Dyson equation, because this W forces you to keep open the, the bubble, let's say, the independent particle term. So these two terms are uh, indeed the electronal exchange, this one, and the electronal interaction. And let me comment also on the fact that this is called electronal exchange, and it comes from uh, the functional derivative of the Hartree term. So the Hartree term is the direct interaction term, the classical term in the electron worlds. When you shift to the electron all worlds, uh, it depends the exchange term. And instead, this W comes from the derivative of uh, the screened exchange. So the, the Fock term, or the screened Fock, uh, is the exchange term in the electron language. Now we move to the electron language, and this becomes the, the direct term for electron and those. So we said that we statically screen W. So W in general is a quantity which depends on two times. Uh, and instead, we take this uh, approximation, which means omega equals 0. And then in the, let's say, Feynman diagrams representation, it means that you have the same time between the two ends of the electronal interaction. Now, it's, it is a, a four-point four equation, so it is not convenient anymore to solve it in G space, because otherwise you would move to G space, you would have uh, four G vectors, and it would be too much demanding. I mean, you would have a very huge matrix. So it's much more convenient to move uh, in the transition uh, space representation. You, sti you still have uh, four indexes, uh, and one, and two, and three, and four. But the advantage is that you, you just need a few bands uh, to converge. So you can keep uh, the, the size of the matrix uh, still reasonable. Although the, the tricky point usually in extended system is that there is uh, a momentum index attached to, to one, each of these. Uh, and the, let's say, the convergence with the momentum index is, uh, is uh, let's say, the most demanding part of them. So, okay, this is the, the form of the Hamiltonian. You have here the, your quasi-particle corrected energies, uh, and here you have uh, this um, electronal exchange uh, and the electronal screen interaction, and you have these uh, occupation factors awaiting the kernel. And if you try to change this N1, N2 in valence, conduction, conduction, valence indexes, you, need, you end up with a matrix like this. Now, what we are interested in are exciton between valence and conduction transitions. This is uh, this block. And we, we can forget about the rest. Also because, uh, I mean, this one is zero due to these uh, occupation factors. And this one is not important. Indeed, you can also, if you want, uh, try to rewrite this in a more symmetric way with respect to occupations and to have the occupation, the square of the occupation on the left and on the right. And you can prove that also this term will go to zero. And then this, uh, this part will be independent. And then we, we just focus on this. So when we solve the beta salpeter, we solve the beta salpeter in this space, valence to conduction. Now, we have both the valence to conduction transition, so an electron moving up, but also the conduction to valence, which is uh, minus uh, the Hermitian conjugate, or, uh, minus the star of this uh, valence to conduction term. So here you see valence conduction again. And then you have this coupling between transition going up and transition going down. So this is... Uh, much more intuitive physically. You say I have the ground state where all the electrons are in valence and I can excite them up in the conduction. But in, in reality, your ground state in this representation, which is just a, a mathematical representation, your connection basis set, could be just not all the electrons in valence, could be a more correlated one with, uh, you have to take, let's say, multi-determinant. And then it means that in principle, you could also have the excitation from this uh, occupied conduction state going down. I mean, this part is less intuitive. This is the, the most intuitive. And the two can couple. So this is the structure of the matrix. And the, in many cases, the Tandankov approximation is very good. So the coupling with this ex between excitation and excitations, you can neglect them. Uh, and uh, you can just focus on, uh, on this term, basically, for describing uh, the accidents. So indeed, uh, in the Tandankov, if you w just want the absorption, you can really do the resonant only calculation. And this is what we often do in, in practice. 
And uh, okay, I, I will show examples where this is, uh, is not a good idea, but uh, in general, uh, it is a good approximation. So let me focus on spin. I, I will discuss about spin uh, at length. It will take a, a bit of time during this lecture just to, to uh, I mean, give you all the details of how the spin enters. And uh, the first uh, simple answer is that, uh, OK, let me say that first of all, we can have uh, different levels of uh, calculations uh, in the ground state. So we can do a collinear calculation for non-spin polarized system. Uh, where both the S square, uh, the total momentum, and the SZ momentum is a good quantum number for your system. You can have a magnetic system, but uh, still without spin orbit, and uh, SZ is still a good quantum number. You will see that S square uh, is a bit less a good quantum number. And then you can have the, the non-collinear case where you have spin orbit and even SZ is not a good quantum number. In your DFT calculations, this ends up on uh, the kind of wave function you have. In the collinear case, uh, the, your spin area wave function can be represented by that, and then you forget that it is a spinner. You just take uh, either the up part or the down part. In the spin area case, you, you deal with a full spinner. And then the distinction between uh, non-spin polarized and spin polarized is that in the non-spin polarized, the up and down components are the same. So you even forget about this spin index, and you have just a general wave function. So when you translate, instead, in the case of a spinner, I mean, you deal with a spinner, you have a, a big index for the spinorial state and for the spinorial energy, and then inside uh, it's hidden uh, the, the spin index. So in the many body language, uh, when you compute the green function, I remember this, uh, this arrow is a representation of the green function. In the collinear case, you can uh, assign a specific spin state to the green function. In the non-collinear case, you just have uh, a representation of, uh, let's say, my, my spinner. And this means that if I, when I do all the derivation with my Feynman diagram, green function, uh, formally nothing changes. So this is, for example, a vertex. It's the same in the non-spinorial and spinorial case. The representation, just in the non-spinorial case, I can explicitly put a, a spin index. And I know that, for example, the interaction is conserving the spin. So I need to have the spin, the same spin on the left and on the right. While instead in the non-spinorial case, uh, the spin index in enters in the integration of this vertex. So I have a, a sum over the spin index, uh, and I cannot say much anymore on the spin of the I state or on the J state. So why this is important? Let's take my, my BSC, and I start with the collinear case. I can label all my states with the the spin indexes, and I can see what happens to the, the three terms of the Hamiltonian. So the diagonal part, of course, it's diagonal, so I have a conservation of everything, so same VV prime, CC prime, uh, and same spin in between uh, conduction and valence states. And instead, what does it happen to the exchange and to the correlation term? So first of all, I recall the exchange it can be represented in this way, so you have this uh, matrix element between the states uh, with the bare interaction in one case and with the screened interaction in the other case. And of course, here we have a, a double G sum. So this is the, the demanding part of the BSC calculation. So what happens to the spin? Since uh, I have uh, explicitly the spin indexes and I say that at the vertex, uh, the spin must be conserved, in the exchange term, I have uh, this kind of uh, conservation. So I have a first uh, an initial electronal pair, which is coupling via electronal exchange to another pair. And I need that the, the, the spin of the conduction and the valence of both the initial and the final term are the same. And the, instead, it is the conservation is different in the case of the sc uh, screened interaction. In this case, uh, I have the initial electronal pair, and the two can have different spin, the, the valence and the conduction. But then uh, the spin must be conserved when I scatter towards the final uh, valence conduction state. So you see that the conservation this, one, this time is between CC prime and VV prime. Instead, before it was between uh, CV and C prime V. And this has uh, an impact on the structure of the matrix. So I go very slowly. Let's say that I take uh, a, a two-level system with just uh, two electrons, non-spin polarized. 
and I start to consider a possible transition. So spin up transition, the spin is conserved, and I have all the terms. Instead, if I f consider this a spin flip transition, so this down up transition, I see that the spin of the valence and the conduction are uh, different, and then there is no the exchange term anymore. There is just the electron on the interaction. Same for the opposite uh, transition, the other spin flip transition. And finally, for the down-down transition, I have again all the terms, but then uh, pay attention to this, this term here. This is the, the, the term, of, uh, let's say, relating the up-up to the down-down transition, and here you just have the exchange term. And it, this is again because of these uh, spin rules. So the matrix has uh, this structure. I'm starting from a ground state which is singlet, so no spin. And then I, you see that I can immediately block uh, a part of the matrix. This one is uh, completely independent. It has zero all around. And it goes on, on this side. And this is the spin flipping uh, matrix. Uh, I will discuss briefly that uh, again in the end. But uh, you basically have the spin flip transition. Usually we don't consider that in the BSC. And this other one is the spin conserving transition. So I mean the SZ is conserved. And here again, uh, this matrix has a nice structure. I can block it further. I can block into the triplet state where I conserve as Z, but I change the total spin. Or, and in another state uh, where I even conserve the SZ. And these are the two eigenvectors which I can use uh, to, to do this blocking. So one of the excitation is this, is a triplet. And indeed, it is the same as this one. And the other one is the singlet. And since uh, this one is the only which is dipole allowed, uh, usually for non-spin polarized states, uh, you use this, uh, this expression. So this is uh, for one single state. Then you have uh, the k dependence, uh, other states, and then you have a matrix with all this term. So this is the reason why you usually see these two in front of the electronal exchange. So this is what happens for a non-polarized system. What happens for a spin polarized system, let's say it is, uh, I complicate a bit my model. I put one extra electron. Then the, the energy of these two levels up and down is different now, and also the wave functions. And then I consider this frozen, this state, and I just look at this transition from here to here. So yeah, I still have a 4x4 four four matrix. The structure remains pretty much the same, but now I have to take into account that this uh, V can be up, up, down, down, or down, down, and et cetera. I can still block my matrix in spin flipping transition and uh, spin conserving transition, but now at this step, I cannot block it anymore. And here, the reason is uh, somehow that uh, having these different wave functions between the up and the down channel I'm breaking the, the total spin of the system. So let me explain a bit more what I mean by that. So I'm playing with this model. So I have these two electrons here and this uh, lonely electron here, and I'm considering transition from I to K. And if I try to, to take the possible, uh, let's say, excited state, which I get, exciting either spin up here or spin down here, I can try to do linear combinations, and I end up with these two states. Now, these two states, one is a good uh, eigenstate of the spin, is a, a doublet. So I'm, I'm starting with a ground state, with a da which is a doublet, this one. And I have an excited state, which is a doublet, which is uh, reasonable. Instead, this other state is a triplet. And it is uh, is not a good state, because it is not reasonable to, to get a triplet from a doublet. One would expect either I get a doublet, I conserve the spin, either I get a quadruplet, I flip by the total spin by one. And the reason is that to get the correct, uh, uh, let's say, spin structure, so my doublet and uh, also a quadruplet, I need uh, an extra state, which is this one, which I can reach just with two excitations. So this is what is called the double excitations in the community of quantum chemistry. This problem is uh, very well known, and in this, this reference is from the quantum chemistry community. In the community of extended system, we don't care much about that usually. Uh, and the reason is that the total spin of the system is not so much important as a quantum number usually, especially because magnetic material are usually metals, and then you cannot really define the total spin. But uh, well, I mean, one should keep that in mind, especially if you study, for example, the defects in extended systems where you can have uh, some kind of isolated physics, uh, or if you use the BSC for uh, molecules uh, and you have a magnetic molecule, then this is an issue. 
So why we miss double excitations? Because I remember you, we take the BSC, we have a static kernel, which is just mixing single particle transition. And if we want uh, extra transition, double, triple excitations, we need a dynamical kernel. And this is the same of uh, the GW physics. No? In GW, we have a dynamical uh, self-energy, and this uh, dynamical part take into account all the order excitations. Here, we are neglecting them. OK, so let me switch instead to the non-collinear case. As I said, in the non-collinear case, we still have the same terms, but now there is no spin conservation here. So in, uh, when you do the integrals, you have a sum over the spin index. And this is true for the exchange, and it's the same for the correlation. You have a sum. And then uh, instead of having this very nice matrix, we end up with this uh, huge matrix where all the elements are different from 0. This is what you do when you do a BSC calculation starting from a, a ground state simulation with spinors. And then one message is that uh, you, you cannot say much about uh, the SZ quantum number neither, and that uh, you are mixing the spin conserving transition, which we had here and here the two corner, with the spin flip transition. So in a sense, uh, you are mixing the basic transition, which gives uh, excitons, with this uh, spin flip transition, which are the source of manions. So you have a, a wall matrix which mixes somehow exciton and manions. Of course, usually the spin orbit is weak, and this mixing is weak. But in general, I mean, when you solve the, the BSC, you have all the poles. And uh, since you, I mean, you cannot block it anymore, the size of the matrix is four times uh, the size of the, the matrix you would have for, uh, without spins so for the non-polarized case, and also twice the size of the matrix uh, in the spin polarized case. So if you remember, non-polarized case, we did the double blocking, so we ended up with a, a single term. In the case of spin flip transition, we, we did the first blocking, but that we could not block further, so twice the size. Here we cannot say something a priori, anything a priori, so four times the size. OK, so this was uh, pretty much everything on the spin part. And then. Uh, in general, I mean, for, let's forget for a moment about spin. We have uh, this, uh, this big matrix, and uh, we have to solve it. And in the Yambo code, we have uh, different strategies to, to solve this uh, excitonic problem. So one way is that uh, you, you just take this matrix, uh, I mean, this expression, as you see, it's an inversion. And then you, you directly perform uh, the inversion of, uh, of this uh, expression. Of course, the, the, exp the inversion is demanding because you have to do that for each frequency. One advantage is that in principle here you could also add easily a frequency-dependent kernel. So we, we cannot do that yet, or at least not. I mean, we are not going to use it. But this is a scheme where you can invert frequency by frequency, and so you can include eventually uh, dynamical kernels. It will give you just the spectrum and uh, you can do also that in a, I mean, you can do that through the LAPAC Scalapac libraries. It becomes uh, easily very demanding. Uh, but you can also do inversion in a, in a more perturbative way, and it, it is a bit more efficient. An alternative way is to use what is called the Langtsos or uh, IDOC scheme. It's a perturbative scheme. It's the most efficient, efficient scheme to solve uh, this excitonic problem. It has a good scalability. And it is the scheme which you usually use uh, if you want to get a spectrum of a big uh, material. Then on the other side, we have the diagonalization. The big advantage of uh, doing really a diagonalization of these uh, excitonic matrices, matrix uh, is that you will get uh, the excitonic eigenvectors. So the excitonic eigenvectors here are represented by this uh, capital A, N1, and N2. And again, you can do a brute force diagonalization. You will have a huge matrix in many cases, and you can call uh, LAPAC or SCALAPAC in a parallelized environment. Uh, you will get all the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. But uh, this is very demanding, and uh, in general, is not really what we need, because uh, if we are interested in exciton and in uh, excitonic wave functions, usually we want just a few bound states. And then uh, in Yambo, you, you have an alternative approach via these uh, SLEP-C, PET-C libraries, uh, which are uh, exactly meant to, to take uh, these kind of uh, eigenvalue problems and solve them in a perturbative way. So uh, you do a perturbative scheme, which gives you, however, 
the excitonic states and the excitonic energy, but you select just few. So you will tell it just want uh, the first 100 states. You will see that in the in the Yambo input file, and uh, you will have just a portion of the spectrum, but you you know everything about the spectrum. So this uh, let me comment on the general expression of. Uh, the, the electric function from the diagonalization, either diagonalization or slap C. So it has uh, this shape. So you have here this uh, matrix element. Uh, then since you are doing uh, the Q going to zero limit, uh, this will become the dipoles. Uh, you have the excitonic wave functions, and then you have the excitonic poles. And you also have this uh, metric matrix uh, in case you go beyond the Tandankov approximation, because in that case, uh, the Hamiltonian, the full Hamiltonian is not Hermitian anymore, uh, and then the eigenvectors are, are not orthogonal uh, anymore, and then you have to take that into account. This is rather technical. I mean, in the Tandankov approximation, you can forget about that. Uh, so if you do the Tandankov approximation, and in particular, you consider the resonant block, the expression is much more simple. And you see that you end up in, in something which looks pretty much like a Fermi Golden rule. But the difference is that you have here the excitonic energy, and here you have uh, this object, uh, which you can call uh, the excitonic dipole. <laughs> so under all this approximation, especially Tandankov, uh, you, have, uh, you can really think that uh, this, your spectrum is uh, a set of transition from the, the ground state to the excitonic state uh, weighted by the excitonic dipole. Okay, I, I'm not going to the details of the inversion solver because I think we are not using that much in this school. Instead, if you comment on the, the idoc lanzos approach, which is the most efficient one, and the idea is that you can express uh, your, uh, let's say, linear response function in this way. So you have this uh, operator, which is the excitonic Hamiltonian, uh, and then uh, you have these uh, terms on the left and on the right, uh, which are uh, uh, basically, let's say, the, the, di the excitonic dipoles on your system. So it's uh, an expression in terms of a fraction, and what you can do is you can try to solve it, uh, expressing it as a continued fraction. So it means that you first start with uh, an initial simple fraction, which is a zero order approximation, and then you do an iterative scheme. I mean, it's a mathematical strategy. And uh, with fewer, few iterations, or I mean much less iteration than the total size of the matrix, uh, you can get uh, a reasonable spectrum. So this is how it works. So it sta you start with uh, iterating the IDOC uh, solver, and you start after, uh, for example, in this case, after 40 iteration, you get uh, this uh, blue spectrum, which is pretty much similar to the exact one, which is the gray shadow you have in the background. And then the code will... Uh, We'll, do, we'll compare the iteration 41 with respect to the previous one. We will get uh, an idea of the error, and depending on how much is the error, we will decide if I should I go on or not. And then when this, this error will be low enough, according to the cutoff you will set in the input file, the, the procedure will stop. In this case, so it, it's stopping after 86 operation. And uh, I mean, the, the scaling of uh, this approach, I think uh, it goes quadratically with the number of uh, electronal pairs. So uh, it grows uh, still quite fast, but uh, it is much more efficient than standard uh, diagonalization, which goes as a power of four, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so this is the case of the resonant only uh, term, so it's the standard Lanctus. It can also be extended to the non-resonant matrices. It was done in uh, this paper, for example. And there is also a PRB, I think, for the deta details. <coughs> now, a couple of examples uh, of uh, optical spectra obtained via the BSC. Uh, I use them to comment a bit on the physics. So, okay, first of all, we have... Uh, these two spectra, which we have already seen, so I stress again that the BSC, the main role is to capture the bound exciton. Both here in this case system, where we have a strongly bound exciton, so this is a 2 EV binding energy, but also in the case, uh, in the case of silicon, which is uh, a semiconductor, so this is the independent particle part. Uh, also, let me remember that, so you do B DFT, and you get this uh, spectrum, so uh, Koneshama energy differences, then you do the quasi-particle corrections, so you open the gap and you shift the spectrum. You, you get this dashed line. 
And then you do BSC. In this case, the binding energy is not that much. In back silicon, the shift from here to here is a few hundred milli electron volts, even few tens of milli electron volts. But the, the shape of the spectrum is uh, changing, and in particular, there is an enhancing uh, of the first peak. And this is a general behavior. So the, the BSC is giving a binding energy, but also an enhancing uh, of the oscillator strengths. OK, so the, I mean, the approach has been applied to, to many more materials, uh, silicon uh, oxide, lithium fluoride. Uh, this is uh, carbon, uh, and also to surfaces, uh, to, to liquid system. This is just to, the message is just that uh, it is a, a very well-established scheme. It works in a wide range of uh, systems. And here an example of uh, carbon nanotubes. And uh, I use this also to, to give you a message, which uh, it's in general true, I would say. So here you see what happens to the, um, the binding energy of the first exciton, the GW gap uh, of a carbon nanotube, so that you see that they, they change uh, as a function of what well, this called distance as the, the, the size of the nanotube, so of the curvature. So the two are pretty sensitive, and I would say that this is in general true. So when you change system uh, and you play with systems, uh, you will see that the electronic gap can change a lot, uh, and the binding energy can change a lot as well. But in general, the two, they change in the opposite direction. And then if you look to the peak of the first exciton, it will stay pretty much in the same position. So this, for example, also true if you take uh, transition metal decalcogenite. So you take the bulk version, you have a an exciton which is here. You take the 2D version, you have the an exciton, which is uh, more or less in the same place, uh, but the, the gap and the binding energy are very much different. OK, so another point is the, the convergence. As I said, uh, the convergence uh, with respect to the k-point sampling is uh, particularly important. Uh, and uh, it is even more important if you go to, to isolated systems. So this is a case uh, of uh, a, a 2D material, and it is related to what Alberto was discussing for the GW case. So in 2D material, you have uh, the macroscopic uh, the electric function, which has to, to go to one, the exact one. But to get that, in principle, you would need an infinite box. And then you, you cannot put an infinite box in your simulation, so you, you do use a smaller box, and this is what happens to, to your dielectric function. So here we have the limit of isolated. Here we have the limit of the bulk. So when you put some vacuum, you move towards that. But uh, the, the approaching of the, the, the real isolated system is uh, very slow. And so what you do, you, you put a Coulomb cutoff, a truncated, a truncated interaction, and this helps a lot. So it helps in the GW and also in the BSC. So if you, do, if you run tutorial on 2D materials, remember to include the truncated interaction. And you will see how to, to put that in the input file. OK, also a comment on the Tandankov approximation. We said uh, this is the structure of the matrix. Uh, and in general, it's a good idea to neglect the coupling terms uh, in extended systems. And here, uh, in this paper, they study the optical absorption of a 1D system. And the message is, uh, if, you if you look at the spectrum along the periodic direction, then the Tandankov approximation is pretty good. But then if you start to tilt the direction of the field with respect to, to the direction of the carbon nanotube, then you see that the, the tandem of approximation breakdowns in, uh, in some region of the spectra. And so the general message from this is that Tandankov is good for extended system, is uh, usually bad for isolated molecules. Although going beyond Tandankov is always risky. So I'm not going to say much, but uh, there are many cases in, in which uh, Beyond Tandankov, you change a lot of the spectrum, but you also get, uh, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, weird results. OK, a bit of literature. How am I doing on time? I don't have a chairman. I chair myself. OK, I think I still have some time. OK. <laughs> so OK, this is just, uh, I show you some, uh, let's say, reference papers, which uh, you may be interested from the very old ones, uh, the, the paper of uh, Beatty and Salpeter, where you, you find the first derivation and application of the Beatty-Salpeter equation, to 
more and more recent papers, uh, and if you are interested, uh, just uh, you can have a look on this. And in particular, uh, in the let's say ab initio community, there is uh, this very nice uh, review. Which I mean, I wouldn't suggest this as a, a paper to study because everything is compressed. But if you need, uh, you know already what is GWBSC, and you need uh, to check some details, so this is a good reference review. And now let me jump to the last part, so more response functions. So we have stressed a lot, the BSC is important to get absorption spectrum excitons. Uh, you can get the excitonic wave function, the excitonic peaks. Uh, but indeed, uh, once you solve the BSC, you have uh, an instrument, uh, the, this two point, four point response function, which you can use uh, for much more. Uh, so I start showing you so this is usually what we use to compute absorption. So we co use the BSC to compute the density-density response function, uh, and we get uh, this longitudinal uh, uh, dielectric function, if you recall from the lecture of the first day. Indeed, uh, I can go beyond that. I can construct uh, what is called the dipole-dipole response function. And uh, from this, uh, I don't just have the longitudinal term, but I can have the full dielectric tensor. In some cases, it is important. Then I will show you when. And then I also recall you that uh, from the BSC, you can also get the current-current response function, which is an alternative way to get the full dielectric uh, tensor. And I mean, in the TDDFT world, of course, one wants the density-density response function, but the BSC is uh, much more general, and you can compute any of these response functions. So let me highlight a bit the difference between the length gauge, so going through the density density or the dipole-dipole response function, uh, and the velocity gauge where you go through the current-current. And the main message is that this one is uh, much more general and it's very good to use to, do, to go through formal derivations. Uh, you have the vector potential, so you can describe both longitudinal and transverse field. Uh, you have everything there. But there is a drawback. This approach is uh, very delicate with respect to the omega going to zero limit. Instead, indeed, if you look at the expression here. So there is this one over omega squared, and there's also there is this diamagnetic term. Uh, and in an extended system, you don't have a one over omega squared divergence, which means that uh, this term uh, has to cancel exactly this in the omega equals zero limit is a summer rule which is uh, very nasty to be respected. So in this, in the length approach, uh, numerically it is much more stable. As I said, it is uh, compatible with TDDFT. Uh, however, especially with TDDFT, you have to pay attention to the Q equals zero limit. Uh, and this is related to also uh, what Fulvio was discussing before. In the Q equals zero limit, you have to pay attention to the direction. Uh, whether you are describing uh, longitudinal excitation or transverse excitations. Here is uh, all a bit hidden in, uh, in the details because we have uh, a theory which is in principle longitudinal only. Besides that, uh, you can use the, the response function and then uh, eventually move up to the BSC level, uh, although it's usually not useful to also describe uh, intraband transitions. So we have discussed so far uh, semiconductor and uh, valence to conduction transitions. If you have a metal, you can also capture uh, intraband transitions. And indeed, in the length gauge approach, uh, this comes through this Q equals zero limit. So the excitation uh, at small Q, you reach the Q equals zero limit, uh, and you get these intraband transitions. And this term is uh, super nasty to to be converged with respect to k-point sampling. And indeed, uh, in the Yambo code, we use uh, a Drude model to, to account for that in solids. So usually, I mean, you don't want to, to go up to the BSC. We discussed already that in the answering to one of the questions. But uh, in general, if you have that in the zero order response function, you, you could also go beyond. And I also point to a, a funny thing in the Velocity gauge approach, uh, this one over omega squared divergence is there by default, let's say. And indeed, there is uh, some rule uh, to respect that uh, for uh, systems with a gap. Uh, for metals, uh, 
the true determinant enters via a breaking of the same rule. So it's not anymore a small Q transition, it enters via this uh, funny way. <laughs> and in this case, however, it's uh, super nasty to be converged with the number of empty states. Okay, this was just uh, on the true determinant, uh, but mo much more interesting uh, physics uh, can be gained uh, if we switch from, uh, let's say, the standard dielectric function to other properties of the materials. And indeed, when you have uh, this four-point response function, IJLM, depending on the dipoles you select, uh, you can also construct, uh, for example, this uh, beta tensor, where you have on the right uh, the electronic dipole and on the left the magnetic dipole. And you can use that to describe natural circular decrease, for example. Or uh, if you take the spin uh, dipoles, this the S plus, so the dipole which describes a spin flip transition, you can have this uh, chi plus minus uh, response function and, uh, and you can describe spin waves. So the message is you, you solve the BSC, you have a lot of information and you, you could also use to, to get some interesting physical properties uh, to compare with experiments. And I show again a few examples. So we said we, you can have the full dielectric tensor, then you can uh, define uh, the absorption of uh, circularly polarized light, uh, right and left, it's just this uh, combination in between the matrix element. I mean, in this case, I'm fixing the geometry, so the light is moving along the z-axis. I have uh, a magnetic film with magnetization along z. And then I can probe the decrease, so the different absorption between right and left absorption. So these, uh, related to what is called the magneto-optical care effect, and experimentally is, uh, is used a lot to detect the magnetization of uh, a material. What they do in practice, they arrive with a linearly polarized light. Uh, the light arrive on, arrives on the sample, is reflected, uh, and due to this decrease, there is uh, a tilt in, uh, in the initial polarization, and then you can compute the rotation angle. So if you take a metal, uh, you can do that, so you compute all the matrix elements at the independent particle transition, and uh, you get a very nice description. But then in principle, if you have a, a magnetic semiconductor, you could be interested in do the same at the BSC level. So natural circular decrease is another example. It's again the same thing. So you want to measure the difference in between the right and left absorption of uh, a molecule. This is called decrease. So in this case, the information is not contained in this first order term which relates polarization and electric fields, which in the end defines the first order dielectric function. But it has something to do with uh, the response of the polarization to the time derivative of uh, a magnetic field. So if you take uh, this word expression, you have an extended definition of uh, your dielectric function uh, where it has, you have the standard uh, the, the standard uh, alpha, so the standard dipole-dipole response function. And then there is this extra beta where you have this uh, magnetic dipole, electric dipole response function. And this is the one which is giving, for example, decrease in, uh, in isolated systems. And uh, this is uh, an example of, so usually this is computed for molecules. Uh, TDDFT works uh, very nicely, but if you are interested in uh, evaluating decrease in an extended system, you may be interested in using the BSC. It's a challenging uh, adventure, especially because uh, here you have these uh, magnetic dipoles which are ill-defined in periodic boundary conditions. But you may, you may want to, to do that. So another uh, interesting experiment which is very useful uh, to, to study surfaces is uh, related to what is called the reflectance anisotropy spectra, or uh, in this case you can also do high resolution electron energy loss uh, anisotropy. And basically the idea is that uh, you probe the system with uh, uh, polarized light in one direction and the other, and then you take into account in the differences uh, between the, the two absorption. And it's a very powerful technique, and it can give you a lot of details uh, on the surface. And uh, again, you can do that uh, at the simple uh, independent particle level, uh, but you can also do that uh, at the BSC level. So these are uh, an examples of a few applications at uh, the independent particle level in silicon and gallium arsenide. So here you see your, you have to take your box uh, with the surface, uh, so it's a big box with some layer of space, uh, 
safe, same for gallium arsenide. And at the independent particle level, you, could, you get a reasonable description of the experiment. But uh, at the BSC level, so here you see the difference between BSC and independent particle, you get a uh, correction which can be important also in this case. And I think this was, ah, okay, and the, the last one, which is related to the question on uh, manuals. So we said that uh, the response function, uh, I've shown you it has the spin conserving channel, which you can block away, it gives exciton, and the spin flip channel. So if you take the spin flip channel, uh, you can describe what are the manuals. So here is an example of manuals computed at TDDFT level, again. So uh, the blue bar, the blue line is the independent particle response function at different momenta. So usually for manuals, you, you look for a dispersion in momentum space. So you have to solve the, the response function at different momenta. And you see that shifting from uh, spin flip transition to a correlated version, you, you, got, uh, you get a big announcement uh, of uh, a peak at low energy, which is called the magnonic peak. In this case, for uh, different reasons, TDDFT works pretty nicely. So it's not like in the excitonic case that you miss the exciton. With TDDFT, you get the magnon. But then, this has been tested mostly on, on metals, uh, where uh, excitonic effects are not important. If you think now you have a, a magnetic semiconductor, you may be interested in using BSC for that. Okay, and that was also the final message was you have the BSC, you can really try to explore many interesting properties and uh, not much was done indeed. So it's really a, an open area for research and uh, for new results. And uh, okay, I hope I'm doing well with time, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, so session open for questions. Please, are you a member of the Prides? <laughs> ah, yeah, the mic. Uh, where is the mic? I think it's. Uh, so, this is somewhat uh, related to some technicality in Yambo. Uh, so, can we turn off these excitonic effects after certain energy? So uh, I want to compute the absorption spectrum till like suppose like uh, 10 electron volts. So I want to consider only uh, the excitonic effects till five to six EV. And I want to rely on the independent particle level after that. So can we do this thing in Yambo? So if I understand correctly, Yes, you can do. So, I mean, one way is you take the excitonic problem, you use the IDOC solver, you get the whole spectrum. If you insisted that you also want the excitons, you can use uh, well, brute force diagonalization, you will get uh, all the excitons, uh, or you can use this uh, slap C solver, uh, and you can ask to the slap C solver, I want uh, the excitonic wave functions just focusing on this uh, energy range. So in particular, what you tell to the slap C, I'm interested in the exciton around, I don't know, 10 EV, and I want uh, the 10 closest excitons to these uh, 10 EV points, uh, and Yambo will give you that. Okay, so bit addition to that. So now uh, I want to consider like, uh, suppose like four valence bands and four conduction bands. Yep. And above like a four to like 10 conduction bands, I want to I don't want to include the excitonic effects. Okay, so let's say you said that uh, for the first few bands I want the excitonic effects and above I am not interested. This is what I'm not interested in. Well, what I would do, I mean, you can do by end, you just solve the excitonic matrix with few bands. And then of course you should pay attention that, uh, to convergence because uh, I mean, you select an energy range but maybe the transition will mix with higher energy range. You get the excitonic spectrum there and then you compute the independent particle one with m many more bands, and then you overlap the two. This could be a receipt. Okay. <coughs> okay. So when you include the coupling in the absorption with the beta salpeter equation, I found that the standard procedure in Yambo is to add just the exchange part of the kernel for the coupling. Ah, yeah. 
So can you comment on that? Yes. So well, we said, so we said, first of all, that coupling is important for isolated system. And uh, in general, uh, if you try, you see that uh, uh, the electron exchange is the most important term for coupling, uh, while the electron interaction is not. So by default, Yambo will just add the, the electron exchange. You can also ask to the code there is an input uh, flag, the flag in the input file, also add the electron interaction. And we, we don't uh, do that by default because uh, it's more demanding and you don't gain much usually. And I think the reason is that uh, coupling has something to do with, uh, let's say, going up in energy and going down in energy excitations. Uh, and this is what uh, usually is important for a plasmon. The physics of a plasmon uh, is captured b well by the electron exchange. You don't need the electron interaction. And indeed, this is why. Indeed, for example, in this paper, the, the message that they give uh, is that you, you go along this direction, you have excitons, uh, and then you start to tilt the field, uh, and you have a kind of mixing between exciton and plasmons. So this is the language used. OK, thank you. Thanks. I'm repeating a question from before about magnons, mm -hmm. and more generally the ability of BSC, especially in the AMB implementation, to take into account also other two particle interactions, not just electrons and holes. So no, I, I didn't get the last point. Well, um, I know there are some extensions of BSC to include uh, spin interactions, for example, not for electrons and holes necessarily, but also for other two spin states. Okay, More so you generally. mean spin-spin uh, interactions? Spin-spin interactions. Some people think about it for copper pairs, for example. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that spin-spin interactions are uh, somehow effective interactions that you, you build up from, uh, let's say, uh, the fundamental Hamiltonian because you really want to capture the physics of uh, magnons or other kind of things. I would say that here we are at the basic level, uh, and uh, with the direct electronal interaction, you somehow have uh, some effective spin-spin interactions. You don't have everything, because in some cases you may need uh, to go beyond the static approximation, but I, I think you already have much. Uh, so you, you can get a lot. In the literature, there is a lot on uh, using uh, TDDFT for manuals. And usually the issue is not the interaction, so the exchange correlation kernel of TDFT is already pretty good. And the reason is that what you do, I mean, you have a, a magnetic system and you have a, an exchange splitting between the spin up and spin down then. So to get a manion, you need a kernel which is able to close that. And so you need a kernel which is exactly the difference between the spin up and spin down exchange correlation potential, and this is what you get with TDFT. And with BSC, you pretty much get the same, so you have a, the spin splitting, which is determined at the GW level or COSEX level by W. And then the, you have the W interaction, uh, and this closes the gap. And the other comment I have is that to, I mean, this balance is very tricky, and it has to do something to do with the fact that the manion, uh, like the, phon the phonon, has to respect the sum rule. So you need to respect what is called Goldstone sum rule. The manion at zero momentum should be zero, at least without spin orbit. And this is something you can check uh, that uh, it is respected by TDFT, by BSC at a certain level. And I would say that the respecting of this Goldstone sum rule is the most tricky part because you need many bands to. Thanks. David? Yeah. Yeah, there is a, there is a question uh, from uh, remotes by Tom Sayer, maybe you can unmute yourself and... <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, you can. Okay, right. <laughs> thank you, David. Your, your talk's delightful. Um, so you, you had a slide on the, the intraband transitions and you, you brought up Andrea Marini's thesis and you said it's uh, very, very tricky uh, to converge this problem. Yep. So if I, if I ran in the AMBO some system um, which is slightly metallic, uh, will it try to calculate these things automatically within the BSC or do I have to tell it, oh, we want to include intraband transitions, et cetera? So, I mean, the first message is if you have a metal, 
usually it's not very useful to do BSC because the meta will screen a lot and you are not interested. Okay, in well, let's BSC. say it's a dope semiconductor. Okay, let's say that you have, a, I don't know, a, a semi-metal or uh, I mean some uh, weakly metallic system, so well, the metallic density is uh, very low. So if it's a 3D metal, you can use this uh, Drude model. Uh, Although, I mean, it's not, I mean, you, you can try, so you, it will add uh, this uh, draw the term to, to the response function, uh, and you can both include that in the screening uh, and in the final response function. If you have some uh, semi-metal where the dimensionality instead of the Fermi surface is lower, uh, well, you can still use it, but I mean, this is designed for uh, uh, 3D metals, so I think you, you should include a better model. So for example, for graphene, we were discussing with Alberto, we, one could in principle extend the approach and insert other models, so yeah, it's pretty simple. Okay, but it will need uh, additional no, development. No, I mean, in the, yeah, you, you can try brute force, but uh, in the end it's uh, the convergence which will be, will be a nightmare, so I think, uh, I mean, to... It's not a good idea, okay. It's not a good <laughs> Thank idea. You. Can I, can I, can yeah. I add? And there is, a, there is an important point. I mean, Yambo cannot calculate that omega d square. The omega d square is the nasty part. Of course, that mm -hmm. expression is not little, it's just simple, of course. Yeah. The problem is that omega d square, if you work out the expression above, you see that it's a surface integral. So it's just an integral restricted on the Fermi surface. So um, when you do any calculation with quantum espresso or that you pass to Yambo, it is a regular grid that at least have one point on the Fermi surface or a finite number of points on the Fermi surface. And this is not enough to integrate and to get the Duda frequency. So the Duda frequency must be calculated outside using tricks. And, and it is a really difficult thing to converge. In that case, it was calculated by doing an integral on a Fermi surface that is a little bit, uh, you know, the, the, the width is increased because of a fake temperature added. But essential information is that omega d must be provided in the input file from an external calculation. Then Yambo uses that simple analytical form mm -hmm. that holds for 3D materials. Exactly, yeah. This is, I mean, that omega d square is not an output of Yambo, but not because it's not coded, it's because it is impossible. I see, right, this is very, I mean, it's not impossible, but I mean, super Thank demanding. You. you need a really super. The regular machine. grid is impossible because a regular grid will, regular, will, yeah. will put a, a fun, a discrete group of points on the Fermi surface, and with a discrete point, points, you cannot do the integral. Yeah, I think you can use some can try to use some tetrahedron method to integrate in case space so this uh, this integral, and then I mean. Well, you, well, you I mean, the Fermi capture. surface of a of a simple metal is a yeah, surface. Yeah. Already, if you increase the complexity of the material, Fermi surface can be, you know like arts, like yeah. painting. Yeah, I mean, you it's just super have, I mean, one, one trick you can use, which was also explored here, is to, to smear the occupation with some temperature, so you somehow, somehow broaden the Fermi surface. And then you can, instead of doing this, uh, I mean, in Yambo, whenever this, there is this integral, we replace it with a sum over k points, uh, which is uh, a very simple approximation because we are not focusing much on, uh, on this kind of, uh, Integral, so well, let's say it is the it is much more compatible with many body perturbation expansions, but then you can also try to do that with tetrahedron methods in 3D, they are very sophisticated and you could converge faster. Now, just a simple comment uh, I want uh, to say that we are working on alternative methods to, to solve this issue. Okay. So you, you mean models or? A uh, uh, way to treat the intraband transitions. Yeah, but I mean through a model system like uh, the Rude like or to do uh, some? But also a Vinicius, I would say. Okay. Without any parameters. Okay. So maybe in the next releases there will be something. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as you showed, I mean, you're constructing the BSC Hamiltonian for every K point, and you have uh, a dimension of uh, conduction times valence bands. So, for example, like uh, if you consider exciton as a hydrogen model, uh, like, so we only have uh, NC times NV excitons here, excitonic energies, but 
uh, can Yambo compute the excited states of a, a, a single exciton? For example, like uh, like uh, they rename this as one S excit and uh, the second excited. So first, let me take a moment. The, BS, the size of the BSC is uh, number of valent states times number of conduction states times number of k points. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about so, for every k point. Yeah, but, so. I, but so the k points are, will mix together and this is the main uh, effect of the BSC. So you, you have a system which is, uh, let's say, an infinite system and you have many k points and uh, the transition in between different k points will mix a lot to build up your exciton. So if you think uh, to the exciton in terms of the hydrogenic model, your excitonic wave function will be given as a superposition of many k points. This is the, the main. Uh, but we have like a series of exciton energies. Uh, then like, you have a series, yeah. Uh, so uh, like what I want to ask is like, uh, we only have this uh, nk and nv and nc excitons because we are diagonalizing uh, the size of our matrix is N NK, NC, NV. Yeah. But like uh, we can have like a number of excited, uh, many excited states for every exciton, right? But I mean this uh, MV, NC, NK is the basis set you use to get all the excitons. So uh, I mean one of the features of the BSC is that you capture all kind of excitons in the Wittberg series. So you get the 1S, 2S, uh, 2P uh, excitons and you get really everything. There is n nothing left behind uh, besides the mixing with uh, higher order excitations. Okay. So you, you really get all the excitons just as a well-defined peak. They don't have a lifetime. And in case they mix, I mean, you don't have, uh, as in the GW, that you have some uh, uh, satellites. You miss that, but you have all the excitons. Do you think more questions or? I don't know. I yeah. Don't know. Okay. There is a question from online, okay? I don't know. Uh, yeah, there is another question from online, online by Rashid Khan. Please. Rashid? Yes. Uh, uh, hear me? Yeah, not very yes. well. Hello. Okay. Um, uh, actually, uh, I want to calculate the emission spectra of uh, the scintillator material. So, can I calculate emission spectra with the help of the Yambo core? So, you, you said that the emission spectra and not the absorption, right? Yes. So, I mean. Not absorption. In, in general, I would say no. Yambo is focused on absorption, uh, but it shouldn't be too difficult to move from absorption to emission. Indeed, the, the I mean, the, there was a, a person who studied the, the emission spectra, which is photoluminescence, uh, and he did the coding. I think it's not yet available in the GPL. No. But uh, I mean, also, I, I would say that uh, emission is very similar to absorption. So uh, as a zero order approximation, you can just take the absorption and, uh, and use it to, to infer on the emission. Yeah, a zero order. <laughs> I mean, uh, usually, at, at least I would say, and then I mean, you can correct me, for extended systems, it, it is a good approximation unless you have some, uh, let's say, uh, exciton self trapping, some, polar some polarons, then in that case, the emission can be shifted. But in general, I would say absorption and emission are more or less the same. In isolated system, instead, uh, usually you get the stock shifts. Uh, but this is more a matter of atomic uh, position shifting rather than uh, uh, a different theory. And if you want to go to one minute, uh, feel free. <laughs> okay, so f from a physical point of view, absorption and emission are, are very different. I mean, uh, absorption, you don't need to quantize the electromagnetic field. For emission, you need to quantize the magnetic field. So it's very different. So within certain approximation, it can be very stringent, like detailed balance, this kind of stuff that has for molecules. You can say that the peaks correspond, mm -hmm. the weights are different. So to calculate the weights of the luminescence, even in very stringent approximations, you need to take it in account the inversion of population. So mm -hmm. the, the general message is, don't just take the absorption in, in, as, as an inverse for the luminescence, 
just try at least to, to get the general physical continents, at least the inverse of population, the fact that transitions are just from, from different states. I mean, as yeah, a general, very But I mean, it's, it's the same excitonic matrix. Uh, then you have extra transition. Uh, if you have a very low density, in general, the excitonic poles are really the same. Yeah, but uh, the, at the numerator, if you look at the, even in the super simple, the most simple thing, in, in, a, in, a, in the case of the absorption, you, you go from an occupied to unoccupied states. In luminescence, you go that way around. Yeah, from occupied above to unoccupied below. So it's not the same transition. No, it's the opposite. I mean, it's minus the... But in photoluminescence, at the you wouldn't have, you have zero photoluminescence at the equilibrium. There is nothing. No. Yeah. So this is just... So be careful. Just be careful. It's not as simple as absorption. Just be careful. Okay. So I'm, I don't know. I chair myself. I think it's time to move to the next speaker. <laughs> and uh, okay. thank you.